Welcome to this presentation on the development of the OctoEchos. Before we get started with the actual presentation, I want to acknowledge and thank Dr. Guidus Gapsis, a musicologist who teaches at l'Ecole de Chant du Coeur Gorien de Paris. Many of the slides in this presentation are courtesy of him. This presentation is a complement to the previous videos that describe the basic structures of the archaic modes and the eight ecclesiastical modes. The purpose here is not to review that material, but to give some insight as to how and why the system of eight modes developed. If we create a chronology of Western theoretical treatises about music, we see that up into the 8th century, pre-Carolingian, there is no discussion of anything called the Octoechos, or the Eight Modes. However, during the Carolingian period and after, 9th century and onward, we do see treatises discuss the Octoechos, the Eight Modes. And not just a few, but many. Where did this come from? How did it develop? And why? Theorists, by nature, tend to be observers of musical practice. They analyze and comment upon current practice in order to discern and clarify its governing principles. So what was the current practice during the Carolingian period, and how did it differ from previous practice? One difference in this period from previous periods has to do with simple musical development or evolution. We have already seen evidence of an archaic modal system. This system had three modes, each a single pole mode. That is, one in which the final of the mode and its psalmodic tenor were the same. We believe that musical practice slowly expanded this, these basic structures. The tenors tended to move higher, and the cadences tended to drop lower. The structures began to move toward a bipolar system, with different notes for the final and the psalmodic tenor, or the dominant. We also believe that these were relatively common developments in the chant repertoires that evolved somewhat independently from region to region. That is to say, that there were common musical structures that evolved around texts that were largely common. The differences were more in the way that these structures were ornamented than they were in the essential skeletal structures of the music. We have evidence of chant repertoires in at least five different regions, Rome, Benevento, Milan, Spain, and Gaul. All of this music was composed, improvised, performed, which was all one kind of integrated process, and transmitted through an oral tradition. None of it was written. However, in the 8th century, a remarkable set of historical events had a significant impact on the development of this music. At the end of the 8th century, Pepin the Short entered into a rapprochement with Pope Stephen II. In exchange for the Pope giving Pepin's claim to the throne legitimacy, Pepin agreed to give the Pope protection. As a part of this process, the Pope came to Gaul and stayed with Pepin for a lengthy period. During the Pope's stay, Pepin was exposed to the Roman liturgy. He saw in this liturgy a way to unify his kingdom religiously and also politically as a kind of byproduct of this religious unification. He set in motion a process which his son Charlemagne would complete in which he imposed the Roman liturgy throughout all of Gaul. 
he asked the Pope to send musicians and also books of the Mass to Gaul to help him spread the Mass throughout his kingdom. Remember, at this time there was no written music, only texts. Since the texts of the Mass had been relatively uniform since the late 5th century, it was no problem for the Franks, that is the subjects of the Frankish kings Pepin and Charlemagne, to absorb the texts. However, with regard to the music, it was a different matter. The Frankish musicians were not as comfortable with the Roman chants as they were with the texts. What transpired was a kind of hybridization, music that was essentially Roman in its contour, but infused with a Frankish style of ornamentation. This Romano-Frankish hybrid is what we have come to call Gregorian chant. Eventually, as the Holy Roman Empire spread its influence southward, the various local bodies of chant were suppressed, and the Romano-Frankish, that is Gregorian, chant became uniform practice throughout the land. There are numerous sources of evidence regarding this hybridization process and the suppression of local repertoires, but we'll leave that exploration for another time. Sticking to the 8th and now 9th centuries, this hybridization process gives us, in a sense, a new repertoire. Not quite the same way we have seen in recent years, but new nonetheless. Theorists, as they are wont to do by their nature, began to observe, analyze, and comment upon current practice in order to discern and clarify its governing principles. The primary tool that they seem to have used to talk about these musical developments was the ancient Greek system of modes. However, their understanding of this system was flawed in at least two ways. First, the Greek modes were essentially descending scales. While the Western theoreticians were looking at these modes thinking they were ascending scales. Secondly, and partially as a result of the first misunderstanding, Western theoreticians misunderstood the placements of half and whole steps in the Greek modes. So while they adopted the language of the Greek system, the octoechos, or eight modes, and four basic modes called protus, deuterus, tritus, and tetraudus, each with an authentic and plagal form. What they were describing was not a rebirth or rediscovery of the Greek modes, but something different. Now revisiting the question of why the theorists would want to develop such a system, we think there may have been a second reason at play, that is one more than just musical evolution. Aside from the reasonable explanation, that it's the business of theorists to comment on practice, we also think that the system may have developed because of the need musicians had to help them memorize, which is the way all music was learned at the time, all the new repertoire. Let's take a look at just a few bits of evidence to support this theory. Here we see an 11th century manuscript showing various formulae for the different modes. We see the first line begins, Ecce modus primus, behold the first mode. We also see in this particular formula some interesting characteristic melodic formula of mode one. The leap of a fourth at the beginning, a little different from the more typical intonation that we know with its leap of a fifth. And of course the importance of la. Below this, we see the skeletal formulae for mode 2, mode 3, and mode 4. On the right side of the chart, we see the skeletal formulae for mode 5, mode 6, mode 7, and mode 8. 
We can almost envision canters using such formula as sort of warm-ups to get the sounds of these modes in their ears so they can remember the repertoire more easily and more correctly. Here we see a transcription of a 12th century manuscript with various formulae. The formulae are set to syllables that probably stand for some text, somewhat like the E U O A E that we still use today, standing for Seculorum Amen, this formula at the end of antiphons. But if they were abbreviations for some text, we don't know what that text is. Notice this particular text. We'll see it again in another manuscript. Finally, we see here a transcription of another 12th century manuscript that gives some common melodic formulae for the different modes. By this time, the formulae comprise melodies that we recognize as common for all eight modes. Another piece of evidence we have regarding this value of or purpose for the development of the octo-echos is the development of toneries. Here we see a page from the tonery of saint Riquier. This is one of the oldest toneries we have. It dates from about 800, shortly after the hybridization of Frankish and Roman chant would have been begun under Pepin and now continued in the year of his son Charlemagne's crowning as Holy Roman Emperor. A tonery essentially is a listing of antiphons grouped not by the liturgical function but by their tone or their mode. We see here Greek terminology. The authentic protus. This is mode one. Then there is simply a listing of antiphons that belong to mode one. Then we see plagal protus, that is mode two. Then a listing of the antiphons in this mode. At the bottom is the same thing for the authentic deuterus, or what we would call mode three. By thinking about similarly constructed or composed antiphons together, the singers can perhaps remember them more easily. This kind of approach, providing memory aids in the chant books, continues up to our own day. Here we see a 10th century Aquitanian manuscript. Notice at the end of the top line the abbreviated labeling for Tetraudus Autentus, that is mode 7. Then we have the ending for that same mysterious set of syllables we saw in the transcription of the 12th century manuscript. This is followed by the Gloria Patri, written out completely, thereby giving us the complete psalm formula. Finally, we have the chant, Puernatus, a mode 7 chant. As we just mentioned, this practice of providing memory aids continues up to the present day. In current chant books, the chants are labeled by mode, so we know what to expect melodically. In this particular antiphon, we see that it is labeled as mode 1 with a particular ending for the psalm tone labeled as 1G. And at the end of the antiphon, we are given the Gloria Patri formula, which shows us exactly what ending 1G looks and sounds like, so we know how to end the psalm verses properly. Today, because every singer has a book, these memory aids don't work quite the same way they did in the 9th to 12th centuries, but the oral signals that they still give us do offer us at least a sense of how such aids worked during those centuries. So to summarize, we might say that the octoechos developed partly as a result of musical evolution and partly as a way to offer singers useful memory aids for the new repertoire that was developed as a result of the hybridization of Roman and Frankish chant. The terminology was Greek, 
due to the medieval theorists' interest in Greek musical theory, but the system was truly Western, bearing no relationship to Greek modes.